Good evening. I, uh, I'm excited about being here. I've looked forward to this. I appreciate Rick asking me to, to come tonight. and um, I'm just going to get into it. Can I do that? Can we just get there? Um, if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians. It's awesome that they put it in your books. If you don't, just use this verse right here. Okay, guys? How simple is that? And if you got a pen, I'd encourage you to take notes because in case your, your wife asks you, what did you do tonight? What did you talk about? Maybe you could share with her or maybe somebody at work tomorrow you can tell about what we talked about tonight. So I'd encourage you. Listen, I wanted to uh, do something a little bit different. I, uh, it was about a year ago, right before Christmas, and uh, I uh, was looking in my desk drawer downstairs in my uh, home in Tuscaloosa, and I was reaching way back in the back, and I was uh, searching for uh, something, and I found, a, I found something, and I, I pulled it out, and I didn't know what it was, and it was a stack of letters, and it had a, a rubber band around them, and it was letters that had never been opened, and I realized that when uh, mom and dad uh, broke up their household, uh, when my dad passed, uh, that mom had all this stuff for me, and uh, one of them was just a stack of letters that people had sent over the years since college to my parents' home, and mom, being mom, she just forgot that she had them. She just stuck them in a drawer. Well, 30, 40 years later, she gives them to me, and, and one of them was, and so I pulled them out, and this was a year ago, and I pulled them out, and uh, I realized one letter was from uh, the University of Alabama, and it was dated 1977, July 22nd, and I thought, well, so I opened it up. Billy, you don't know this story, and so uh, uh, I opened it up, and it's a letter from Coach Bryant. And, and, and I'm sure you got one too. It's a form letter. And it talks about football practice, you know, about the, we didn't have internet and texting and all that stuff the way they do it. He, had, he did things by letter. And, uh, and he writes some things. I want to share them with you just real quick. Just something little. He goes, it talks about winning. He talks about the greatest word, if. And uh, he said, if you believe you can. Um, if team victory comes first, if you put nothing but God, family, education ahead of, if you plan to improve every day, uh, if you receive from me the direction and leadership, instruction, planning, and help that you are entitled to, if you're eager to sacrifice, uh, cooperate, discipline yourself, both on and off the field for the good, if you display class and a winning attitude at all, here's the one I like, if you're anxious to work, um, no one is ever able to work unless in tip-top mental and physical condition. Talks about the fourth quarter. He talks about, I think we opened, we were number one in the country then. That was my junior year. And uh, uh, we opened up with uh, SC or Nebraska. And uh, it was a tough schedule. And, and he, uh, he wrote here how he thought Mississippi, and if there's any Mississippi State grads, I'm sorry. All right, I'm just sorry. But he said he thinks that Mississippi State's going to be our toughest game. I mean, he's already in our heads. And... Uh, because he knew that that would be a letdown. And then I, I turned to the second page, sitting in my home early that morning a year ago, and I realized that uh, Coach Bryant wrote me a handwritten note. And I'm thinking, 37 years later. And I, I just skimmed down to it, and it says, and it's not very flattering, but it, it's a handwritten note. So I thought, well, and so uh, yes, I said, it is late, but you can be the player that was predicted, hoping and praying you do, PB. Paul Bryant. I sat there on that couch and I thought, it is late, but you can be the player that was predicted, meaning I wasn't. Hoping and praying you do. I sat there for a while. I thought, my junior year, I was a, somebody made the terrible mistake of, as a preseason All-American and I, I thought, you know, and I sat there and I thought, was, was I a disappointment to Coach Bryant? Was, was, was I that guy on the team that, you know, everybody's got one, wasted potential, has all the potential in the world, but they wasted it? You know, we've got those people at work. We've got those people. So me being the man that I am, I folded it up, stuck it back in the drawer, and didn't tell anybody. And uh, I, uh, for two weeks went by, and it was Christmas time. We were down at the farm, and uh, Jake and Luke, my sons, and I'm telling you, it was bothering me. So I talked to them. I told them about it. And uh, I said, guys, you know, I, there's nothing I can do about yesterday, but the only thing I can control is today. I said, but, you know, I've come to realize that Coach Bryant didn't want more from me. He wanted my best. 
my best. Huge difference between more and best. And tonight, um, this, when Rick told me what your, your verse was right here, this is uh, from Paul, the Apostle Paul, but Almighty God has given you and I an outline, and we're going to break it down tonight about what our best looks like from being a man. And, and so if, 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 if you're attentive and listening, say amen. amen. So let's, let's just get there and let's get in this verse. Let's tear it apart. And I just pray, and, and we have been praying that uh, tonight is a night that we don't leave that door or this door the same. Let's just refuse that, okay? And so uh, first, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like a man. Be strong. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 14, and do all this in love. Be watchful. Watchful means that you and I as men, as our families rest and sleep inside of the fortified walls, you and I are called to walk the wall. That's what it means to be watchful. You and I are called to literally walk the wall so our, our family, our children, our wife can rest, so that they can sleep, so that they don't worry about the enemy attacking them because you and I are doing our job. Be watchful. That's what it's about. I, I know that, uh, that you had John Crow here last time. And John, a friend of mine, mentor, probably 20 years ago, John called me at my office here in Birmingham. And, and, and John, um, also, it was about, I'll never forget it. And, and Jake, my oldest son, was probably eight years old at the time. And, and I picked up the phone and, and, and uh, I, I just said hello. And John goes, Rich, he goes, I'm going to see Jake this weekend and I'm going to walk up to Jake and I'm going to say, Jake, who's the godliest man in your life? He goes, Rich, what's he going to say? Is he going to say uh, my pastor, my, my grandfather, my Sunday school teacher? He goes, Rich, if he doesn't say anybody other than my dad without hesitation, you're failing miserably as a father. And he slammed the phone down. <laughs> hey, that's a brother, right? That's a true story. No, all I said was hello. And I, I'll never forget sitting there and thinking, what would Jake say? And I mean, oh, we've, he could make a, you know, make, hit a T, you know, he could do all, he shot his first, he, you know, we checked all those boxes, but would he say my dad without hesitation is the godliest man in his life? I don't know what he would have said. How many drinks? How many curse words? How many dirty jokes? How many, how many anger tantrums does it take for you and I to lose our witness, guys? Just one. Be watchful. Plug in. Engage. Invest in your family, in your wife, in your children, what they're watching, who they're with, who their friends are. Engage with them. That's what being watchful is. Protect them from the, walk the wall. Come home early from work. Be their little league coach. Don't let anybody else lead your child to Christ. Okay? Can we just get that out? Don't let his Sunday school teacher, don't let the pastor do your job. You and I are called to be watchful. That's our job. You guys remember Eli? I mean, have you ever read about Eli in 1 Samuel? Pastor, I mean, my goodness, 1 Samuel 2, 12, read it. Write it down and read it tonight. You talk about a disaster of a dad. I'm talking about a disaster. God, God judged Eli. He was such a terrible father, unengaged. He didn't understand what being watchful was. God judged Eli on how he raised or how he didn't raise his sons, the Bible says. He was a disaster. Be watchful. Guys, I can't find one place in the Word of God where it talks positively about a passive dad. Get involved. Get engaged. Be watchful. That's what he's talking about here. Okay? We good with that? We clear? Hey, men, let me, let me encourage you too. Every chance we were with Rick, we were talking about hunting. I was with Jake and Luke, my two sons, and... and I hug and kiss my sons. And they probably, you know, when, when I, 
I hug them and I kiss them and I tell them how proud I am of them and I tell them how much I love them every time I'm with them. And I'm begging you to do the same thing. You be that guy in your children's lives that is their biggest fan. You be that person that lifts your child up every single time. Be watchful. The world's tough enough. Let's you and I build our children up every chance we get. Be watchful. Second, be firm. Be firm in the faith. Be firm in the faith. I want you to, to turn to the guy next to you and at, just ask him right now. I, just, I really want you to do this. Just say, how much God do you want? Just ask him. Go ahead. Turn to the guy right now. How much God do you want? How much God can you handle? How much God do you want, guys? Be firm in the faith. J.C. Riles is one of my favorite authors. Holiness. If you haven't ever read a book, guys, read the book by J.C. Riles, Holiness. If, if, you, if, if you can get up off the floor, then, then keep reading. And Riles talks about in a chapter there, under the title of The Cost, he said, if your religion costs you nothing, he said, I suggest your religion's worth nothing. And so I'm asking you tonight, how much God do you want? What's your religion costing you? Is it costing you time, sacrifice, ridicule, suffering, service? Ask yourself, what's your religion costing you? I'm, and when I'm talking to you, you understand I'm not just going to keep repeating all night that I'm talking to myself, okay? This is very fresh. This is what God wants me to understand. What's our religion? What's our faith costing us? And Paul's telling us to be firm in the faith. In and, and, and 1 Kings 18, 21, where Elijah, and I saw a verse here where Elijah's standing there, and he is a crowd of one. And there's 450 priests that worship Baal, that worship the world, and Elijah just simply looks at them and he goes, listen, if Jehovah God be your God, worship him. He said, if Baal be your God, worship him. But stop wavering between two opinions. It doesn't work that way. How many of us here, hey, I know it real well, right, Billy? We understand one foot in the world, one foot in church, trying to play one. It doesn't work, does it? Let's just give it up. Either go ahead, like Elijah said, worship the world, love, just go ahead and fall in love with the world or fall in love 100% with Almighty God. Make your mind up, but stop trying to be both. It doesn't work. You're wasting your time. Been there. You're just wasting your time. How much God do we want? The evidence of your salvation is by the fruit that you bear. How's that going? Where's your fruit? Rick's given me freedom, so I'm just going to go with it. I, 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 uh, I want to try this another way if I could. I... Uh, let me see. I'm finding some of my son Jake's age. Let's just try right here. What's your name? I'm, I won't embarrass you, I promise. Sammy. Sammy? Okay. Sammy, just right here. We're just going to do a hypothetical, if that's okay. Everybody good with that? Okay. Sammy and my son Jake, my oldest son, are best friends. Grew up together. Hypothetical. Did everything together. Baseball, grew up together, spent the night... D now, did the whole thing, been, you know, best man in his wedding, Jake was best man in your wedding, he was there when your kids were born, vice versa, y'all grew up, to, you love each other, you were brothers, okay, Sammy committed a crime, punishable by death, the whole entire community, family, relatives, crushed, couldn't believe Sammy did it, judge sentenced him to death, Jake, my son, his best friend, he went to the judge. He pleaded for Sammy's life. And judge said to, to Jake, he said, Jake, your love for Sammy is so admirable. He said, but someone has to pay the penalty for the crime that was committed. And before 
Sammy could stop him, before Sherry or I, before Jake's wife Katie and his two twin sons could stop him, Jake gave his life for Sammy. Can you imagine that? And every time now that I'm with Sammy, my son gave his life for you. And so I want to be with you. I desperately want to be with you. Because when I'm with you, I feel like I'm with my son. That's just natural, isn't it? And I miss him terribly. And so when I'm with you, Sammy, I look at you, Sammy, and, and I encourage, I'm your biggest encourager. I'm your biggest fan. I do everything to keep outside stuff outside so that you can live a life that is so worthy of what my son did for you. So that you, I would like beg you, every time I'm with Sammy, I'm begging Sammy, Sammy, dream God-sized dreams. Pray God-sized prayer, Sammy. You be Billy Graham times a thousand, right? So that you, your life is so magnified. Why? Because my son gave his life for you you, man. And so my intensity is there. My love for him is now t- to you. And, and, and when I'm w- with Sammy, then, and, and, and we go through this, and, that, and, I, and over a period of time, Sammy's got family, a job. He's got all these things pulling on him. And before you know it, Sammy gets to a place to where he's, he's not as fired up. He's not as thankful of what Jake did for, for you. And as a, Jake's father, I get to a point to where all of a sudden Sammy's just back into the flow of the world and I'm thinking, I can't believe my son gave his life for you. The evidence of your love is how you live your life. Don't tell me. Show me. Talk is so cheap. And so when I'm with Sammy, my heart breaks because my son, I think about my son, what he did for you and how it just went for waste. You talk about wasted potential. You talk about disappointment. And Almighty God wants your best. He wants your best. And that's exactly the way Almighty God feels about Rich Wingo at times. And maybe he feels that way about you because what's your best? Doesn't want more. He wants your best, men. He wants your best. And there's so many times in my life that I've been that disappointment where I've been that, all the potential in the world, right? Wasted. Stop wavering. Make a decision. And so we're just... We're just getting our brains beat out because Satan's having a field day because we're weak-minded, weak-bodied. We're, we're not strong. We live in, we live in a gated communities and, and we just, you know, we, we, you know, hey. And Satan's having a field day. You can't tell the difference between secular and Christian marriages, 50% divorced. It doesn't matter if it's in the church or out of the church. 40% of every home that wakes up tomorrow morning will not have a dad in it. You understand that, don't you? Because dads aren't doing their job. Well, the kids will get over it, and this is the best thing for our family. Hey, divorce is not the answer. It's not acceptable. It's unacceptable, all right? So get that word out of your vocabulary. 80% of every home in the state of Alabama, boys under the age of 13 are being raised by a passive dad or by a woman, either a grandmother, an aunt, or a mother. 80%. They don't know what men look like. Satan's just killing us, having a field day, destroying us. And praise God you're here tonight. Praise God. Have you ever heard the word hupotasso? No, I didn't think so. Hupotasso. Hupotasso. Say it. Okay, let's say it again. Hupotasso. One, two, three. That's it. It means proper military alignment. Greek. Pro, ever seen the movie 300? Yeah? Yeah? Remember the movie? It's a man's movie. Every man ought to have Braveheart, 300, Gladiator, just a testosterone movie, you know? So when you get around too many women, just watch that, one of those movies, you know? Patriot, right? Those are great movies. Everybody ought to have their own little library. 300. You remember when the, the, 
the, the Spartans aligned themselves behind the shield. Remember that? And the Persians, thousands and thousands, outnumbered them, and they attacked, but they would jam the swords to the side because they couldn't get to the Spartans. Why? Because they aligned themselves what? Behind the shield. Paul talks about hupotasso. Listen, he's teaching you and I how to fight. You and I need to learn how to fight. Romans 8, Ephesians 5, Ephesians 6, read it. He's teaching us hupotasso. Okay, let, let me, I need, I need you four guys. Come on, I won't embarrass you. Come on, stand up. I know. Come on, come on, here we go. Come on, let's go up here. Come on. Hupotasso. Let's go. We'll go quick. All right, you ready? Okay, well, you stay here. Come, come, get behind him. You stay right here. Face me. Get behind him. You come back over here. Get behind him. There we go. Keep, no, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. There we go. We're good. We got it. Okay, I hate to do this, but this is just the way it worked out, all right? You're going to be Satan tonight, all right? <laughs> I know, that's terrible. I know. I know. You're Satan. But yeah, even when, you're going to be Christ. So when you, we step down, you're not going to be Christ anymore, all right? All right? All right. Get this. The enemy. Got it? Raise your hand, enemy. It's the enemy. He hates you, by the way. He hates you. He hates your family. He hates your guts, and he wants to destroy you. He wants to distract you, and he wants to disrupt you. He hates you. This is Jesus Christ. He loves you, and he's defeated Satan, and he's our shield. Hupo tasso. I want you to remember it and write it down because I want you to tell somebody about this. G Satan, Jesus, raise your hand. What's your name? David. David. David is us. Everybody say, hey, David. David, David is you and I, guys. This is, this is us right here. Every man in this room, David is us, okay? Okay, align yourself perfectly behind Christ, David. Okay, what's your name? Tyler. Tyler. Tyler's going to be, this, I know this is a man church, but for tonight you're just going to be like our wife and our children. <laughs> Sorry, okay? All right, mate. You got big arms. I felt them. All right, you're all right. Okay, okay. All right, here we go. All right. Hupotasso. Get this. As long as you and I, us, David, aligns himself perfectly behind Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, it says that our wives and our children will run if we do our job, if we love them like we're supposed to love them. They'll perfectly align behind us if we just simply do our job. David's aligned himself behind. The enemy can't touch us, can he? Satan's already defeated him. We align behind the shield of Jesus Christ. It's awesome. We live in the will of Almighty God. What does that look like? You say, Rich, well, what does the will of God look like? Let's put that in practical, everyday terms. The best example I know, and I want you to listen to this, Dr. Tom Eliff, Southern Baptist pastor did a 10-year study, 39,000 married couples, the same 39,000 couples over a 10-year period of time. Everybody clear on that? We got it? Let me see ahead. We good? We got 39,000, the same 39,000 studied over 10-year period of time. One divorce in 39,000 married couples in 10 years when us, David, did his job. When David did these three things, this is what he found that they had in common. When the husband, write him down, prayed with his wife every day. Men, do you pray with your wife diligently, purposely? I'm not talking about breakfast. I'm not talking about lunch or supper table. I'm talking about where you purposely take your wife and you find a place and you and your wife petition God together. Your wife may pray, you may pray one, both of you may pray, that you, but you, and listen, let me tell you, Satan is going to make you feel so awkward. Right now you're thinking, how could I approach my wife? How could I do, listen, he's a punk. And Satan, it, he'll, he'll try to keep you from doing that up until the minute that you say, dear Heavenly Father, and he flees, and I promise you, you'll never want to go without it. Pray with your wives, men. Pray over your wife. Pray for your souls of your children. Pray together as husband and wife. Men, if you're not doing it, start it. About 15 years ago, someone loved me enough to get in my face and say, Rich, are you praying with your wife? And, well, I mean, no. And ever since that time, guys, it has, it has saved, it has grown my marriage. Okay? When the husband and wife pray together, one, when the husband... When the husband and wife study the Word of God, whether it's together, 
a devotion or whether it's separately, but every day grow in the Word. Be sanctified. Grow in the Word of God. Two, three, when the husband and wife attend corporate worship. Men, if you're not attending corporate worship, if you're not plugged into your church, if you're not serving in your church, guys, God calls us to do that. Those three things, that's the best example I can give you that look like the will of God, okay? David's chosen to do that, and he's aligned himself. His wife's going to align herself, and your children are going to align themselves because you're doing your job. Good job, David. Good job. That's right. You hold on to Christ. Where are you going, David? Stay right there. All right. David, David, he's a guy. He's like you. He's like me. Right? Sammy, he's just like you and I. And all of a sudden, you know, I love the Lord. I believe in Jesus Christ. But all of a sudden, let me guess, he struggles with, let me, let me, let me guess, sexual sin. It's amazing. James McDonald said he used to hand out three by five cards to, to huge uh, conferences to men. He said, and, and they would write the top three things they struggle with. He says he, he doesn't do it anymore. He said 90% of every card, it just said sexual sin. Every one of us in this room struggle with that. Satan uses that to bring us down, hold us down. David, he, he, he looks at the internet, and he's looking at some things that he shouldn't be looking at. And so all of a sudden, David purposely took himself out of alignment with Jesus Christ. And who comes with David? Our wife our children. And because David has chosen to, he struggles with pride. It may not be sexual sin. It may be, it may, hey, I've got this business deal. I can handle this on my own. He's taken himself out of the will of God. Gotten out. And all of a sudden, he's put himself in direct alignment with Satan. Does David have a chance against Satan, guys? Step aside, David. You're destroyed because you didn't do your job. And the fact that you didn't do your job, you left your wife exposed to to the enemy. And now that you haven't done your job, Satan's going to destroy your wife, so you're destroyed. Step aside. Step aside. Now remember who's behind him, the children? Guys, just look around. It's because you and I aren't doing our job. It's because you and I aren't being the man that God's called us to be. We're getting destroyed. We think we can handle just a little bit of sin. We love our sin more than we love our Jesus. So David's made a decision to get in line with Christ. Hupotasso, proper military alignment because he loves his Lord and he loves his family. And next time you're thinking about sinning, just the next time you think how good that looks because it does look attractive at times, you think about how much you love your wife and what you're going to do to her if you keep doing it. All right, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Hupotasso, you're not Satan anymore. All right, let's just get that out. Be firm in the faith. Be watchful, be firm in the faith. And then act like a man. Act like a man means don't act like a woman. Lead. Every man in here say lead. 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 Come on. Come on, guys. Lead. This is what God's called you and I to do. He's built us like this. Every man in here, physically, God has made you physically stronger than your wife. Some of you may say, well, you didn't see my wife. You know, like, that says more about you than it does about her. All right? Lead. God has made you physically, he's made you emotionally, and he's made you spiritually stronger than your wife. Lead. Lead. Act like a man means don't act like a woman. Lead. If your wife was here, if I met your wife, I could tell what kind of a leader you were in five minutes. And, and, and you could do that with my wife. I could tell what kind of a leader, good or bad, you were with your wife. Some of you guys may in here say, man, you don't know my wife. My wife is, is tough. And my wife, is, hey, listen, you shut up about your wife. She's your wife, man. That lady one day stood in front of a a pastor and she loved you enough to marry you. And she was willing to follow you. And your leadership, good or bad, is where she's at today. It's on you. It's on you. You take full responsibility for your wife. Lead. 
How's her spirit? How's her love with the Lord? Does she have a quiet time? Are you that guy in her life? Are you that great encourager in her life? Lead. You are the architect of your family, guys. And however your, art, your family is today, I'm just going to lay it on you, okay? Can I just do that? It's on you. It's on me. And you realize in Matthew 25 one day that God says you and I are going to give account for everything. Do you realize that you're going to give account for your time, your effort, your energy, your obedience, lack of obedience, how you loved or didn't love your wife? You realize that. You realize you and I are going to have to give account. Lead. And our society desperately needs men, men that will lead, godly men that will step up and lead. Hey, hey, you ready for this one? Just do the next right thing. Write it down. Whatever that is, just do the next right thing. Live your life like that. Just do the next right thing, whatever that is. Just do it. That may mean some of you need to go on the way home, call somebody and apologize because that's the next right thing. That may be that you need to be that person for somebody. It may be whatever it means, but just do the next right thing. We good with that? That's a great model to live. Great a model. Live it. Just do it. Do the next right thing. Set goals for your family. Set your vacations. Stop letting your wife just take control Sign your kids up for, for camp. Sign your kid, make sure your kids are with you guys. Lead, plug in, engage. That's what a man looks like. Act like a man, not a woman. You say, I mean, you guys here are like me, and you say, Rich, my, my children are gone. They've, I have a daughter or son live in California and they're living with somebody in sin and they're, they're, they're not saved and I, I failed as a dad and, and, and I, you know, it's too late. No, it's not too late. Can I just encourage you, man? Can I just encourage you tonight that you get on your knees, get on your face as low as you can get in a place in front of Almighty God and you battle for the soul of your child? Can I just encourage you? If your son or daughter is not saved and they're not at home, this is the greatest time of your life. You start investing like you've never invested. You now become a parent to that child because you are that child's prayer warrior. Are we good? Give me some practical examples. If I'm in a movie with my wife, Sherry, and it's crap on the screen, five minutes into the movie... Here's just a practical example. Sherry, I'm sorry. This is not, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know it was going to be like this. We need to go. Let's go. Um, we're watching television, and, and there's some TV shows, and, and all of a sudden, Sherry, you know, I just don't feel comfortable, man. Let's change this. Let's watch something else. Lead. Um, you know, you can break that down in any way you want to break it down in. Just, just do the next right thing. Pray. Initiate prayer. Initiate Bible study in your home. Lead. Be that guy. The psalmist, I love this verse. He said, I love the Lord because he heard my prayer and he hearkened. He answered his prayer. And I love him and I will pray to him every day. That's an awesome scripture. Coach Bryant used to walk around the locker room and he used to have that piece of paper and he would, like, I'm looking at Brent or I'm looking at Rick, you know, and he would just catch you by the eye and he would say, be a difference maker today. You know, he, he quietly, he, he was very kind, he, just be a difference maker. He'd come and sit down next to you, you know, and, and he'd, say, he'd say, hey, hey, Rich, uh, be a difference maker today. And, and he would, remember Billy, he would explain that one or two times, Gary, you remember, and he would just, he would just explain that one or two times every three or four years, what a difference maker meant to him. And what a difference maker meant to him was, Rick, don't let him determine the outcome of the game. You put it on your back. You don't let Billy or anybody else, but you control the outcome of the game. It's on you. You make the play. You make the tackle. You make the catch. You do whatever it takes, but you put it on you to win the game. Period. That's a difference maker. 
What a great model for life. What a great business model. But better yet, what a great spiritual model. You put it on you. Who's in charge? You are. It's on you. Don't let anybody else dictate someone else's salvation. Your neighbor, your wife, your child, it's on you. Be a difference maker in their life. Who would come up here today and line this stage and said, because of you, you changed my life. Because of you, your sacrifice, your investment, you changed my life. You took time and you told me the gospel of Jesus. Who would come up here and say that about you, man? That's called a difference maker. I hope each one of you right now can think of people in your life that are difference makers, that invested in you. But I hope each one of you right now can think about who you are to someone. And if you're not, in the words of John Crow, you're failing miserably. <laughs> act like a man means don't act like a woman. Act like a man means don't be a drama queen. Real quick, just do me a favor. If, you've, if you're that guy, if you're that guy that that your wife always worries about that's going to get in a fight at the family reunion with her sister or, you know, or if, if you're that guy that, you know, if there's conflict in your family or whatever it is, hey, look, can I just give you some words of it? Knock it off. You're not that important. You're not that good, okay? Every time you say the word I, before you finish that sentence, do me a favor and just stop and say what I'm about to say. Does anybody really care? I promise you they don't. They don't care. They don't care about anything other than themselves. They don't care what you got to say. Trust me. Unless you say, I repent. Take the word I and me out of your vocabulary. Guys, it's on you if there's conflict in your family. Clean it up. Make that a place where people want to be. Let your home and your family be inviting so that you can lead others to Christ. Act like a man means don't act like an animal. How many of y'all got dogs? Dogs? David, you got a dog? What's your dog's name? Winston. Excuse me? Winston. Winston. Okay. That's a, kind of a manly name. That's good. Smoked a cigar? No. <laughs> Winston. Hey. Let's just say that Winston, that you went on a vacation. Sherry and I, we came and got Winston, right? And we babysat Winston for a week, right? Winston, we scratched, is boy or girl? Kind of a boy, that's a boy's name, yeah. Uh, we scratched Winston and we bathed Winston, we fed Winston. And so like you come by the house and you pick up Winston and Winston's like, I don't know who you are, man. You know, it's like, you know, and you, I love you, Winston. You know, you love Winston, right? You love Winston terribly. That's right. Winston could care less about you. <laughs> Why? Because he's an animal. Winston's an animal, and all he cares about is himself. Just take care of me. That's all I care about. An animal. Act like a man, not an animal. Animals care about one thing, themselves. And they're selfish. Act like a man, not an animal. I, uh, animals, some of you guys may relate to this. Uh, when you go home tonight and your wife goes, well, how was it at the thing tonight with the men? And you go, huh? You're an animal. <laughs> you... You, uh, you're around your house and, and you're the man of your house and, and you want it my way. I want my rest, my needs, my way, on my time. You're an animal. You're an animal. And, and act, act like a man is, is not acting like that. Do, remember, do it all in what, guys? Love. You're an animal. What, what are some practical things that you and I should be doing so that we lift up our wives, men? Open the door. Tell her how much you love her. Tell her how beautiful she is. Thank her 
for everything. She, can I give you a seven-day challenge to outserve your wife? I dare you. And never say a word. Just go home and for seven days, outserve your wife. Do the laundry, do the dishes, clean the house, do whatever it takes, but outserve her. Get there before she does and outserve her. Blow her mind. That's the opposite of an animal. She'd faint, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Call 911. She'll be okay. <laughs> Do you realize the ability you have to bless? I just want everybody to just take a minute and just for a second, just think about the ability that you have to bless people. Just take a second. A kind word, an arm, a phone call. I've been thinking about you, brother. Um, just the ability, the power that you have to bless other people. You can bless other people by just loving them enough to tell them what they may not want to hear, but they need to hear. You have such power to bless those around you. At work, thank you. What a great job. Super work. Great effort. Just the ability to bless. God wants you and I to be attractive to other people so that you and they will be, have a conversation one day maybe that you might lead them to the cross. Go figure. Please don't be that guy that when you die, people at work goes, I didn't know he was a Christian. Please don't be that guy. Act like a man means, and last, don't act like a boy. Boys cry to their mamas. Boys are someone else's responsibility. Be a man. 1 Corinthians 13, everyone, you know this verse. When I was a child, I acted like a child. I want it my way, I want it now. I reasoned as a child. I'm not saying I'm sorry. You say you're sorry first. I thought like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Come on, man. Act like a man. Some of us were only young once, right? But we can be immature for a lifetime. And then finally, I'm going to sit down. Be strong. And, and this, is where, this is where we need to get, and this is where we have to get tonight. And, and Rick's going to come, and he's going he's to clean it up. But I want to I wanna tell you what God's laid on my heart. And I want to tell you what I've been praying for tonight. I don't think he's talking about who can bench press 500 pounds or squat 1,000. I don't think he's one of those world's strongest men contests where they have that concrete ball and that, that big guy's got one of those thongs on. I don't know what that thing is. You know, it's like, gah, you know, and he's picking that ball up and he's putting it up. I mean, you see, that's terrible. I mean, yeah, I'm thinking, and I don't think he's talking about that kind of strength. I know he's not because Paul said, when I am weak, what? When I am weak, then I am strong. Man, in order for you and I to be who God wants us to be, you and I have to be broken at the foot of the cross. You and I have to get as low as we possibly can get in front of an almighty God on our face and seek almighty God. I'll be honest with you. I, I, there's, I, I feel like such an a, a inadequate there's so much of the word and so much that I don't understand and still don't, and I just, I'm desperate for it. Repentance. Every disciple, if you look for repentance, the word repentance, every disciple, John the Baptist, John, Peter, the first, the first word out of their mouth in their sermons as, as disciples was what? Repent. And I, I never really, I knew what repent is. I understand that you change and you go a different, you know, but I kind of just went. You guys know the story about uh, Esau, don't you? Remember in Malachi 1 where he's, Almighty God said, uh, Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. 
Can you imagine God saying that about you and me? Have you ever wondered why he hated Esau? I mean, Esau was a, a man's man. He, he wore hunter's orange. He was a rough, tough guy. He was bowed up. He, he was a man's man. He was arrogant. He was an animal. Selfish. He could care less about his birthright. He cared more about his stomach one day, and he gave up his birthright for a bowl of pea soup. God hated Esau. Why? Listen, because he had no regard for God. He had no regard, no respect. He believed in God. We know he believed in God because we're going to read Hebrews 12. But he had no regard for God. And that is us. That's men today. They say 70% of our society in this country are evangelical. They believe in Christ. Well, can I just lay it there where it, it needs to be put? Esau believed in God. God hated Esau. Are we clear on that? Because he had no regard for God. Because Esau thought he could just sin, confess. Sin, confess. Esau dealt with the same sin like every week. Well, I sin, okay, I'll send that in. But, you know, I'll repent and, I'll get, and, you know, we'll just keep going. And that's how he lived his life. Sin confess, sin confess. And he had a regret. He had a little bit of sorrow, but he never understood godly repentance. And God hated him. So are, you, you may be saying, Rich, are you saying that, that uh, I may not be able to repent? That's exactly what I'm saying. That, you mean I may not be able to repent when I'm ready to repent? You mean I can't just live that life and then one day, you know, I'll change? And yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because that's exactly what Esau said. That's what Esau thought. And in Hebrews 12, 16, it says that Esau came to him to repent and God didn't hear his prayer. God hated him because he had no regard because Esau knew what was right and he chose what was wrong. He loved his sin more than he loved his God. It had nothing to do with believing. And that's, that's what this whole thing tonight's about. God's called you and I to be his elect. You and I will never be the men that God's called us to be until we learn how to godly repent, how do we come to this place. So you say, you say, well, Rich, how do I know if I can still repent? If you still care, if you still can. In 2 Timothy 2.25, write it down. It says that God grants Repentance. You don't make the decision about repentance. Almighty God grants that to you and I. Tonight may be your last chance to repent is what I'm trying to say to you. You may be like Esau. I can just play and do my sin, love my sin, keep, and you know, and it may not be there like you think it will be there. Godly Repentance. Who do we think we are, man? I mean, honestly. I used to think repentance was a place that I would visit from time to time. I've come to realize that repentance is a place that I have to live. What does that look like? What does your best look like? Godly repentance is this. It doesn't mean you have to get on the floor and weep and cry like Esau tried to do. That's not what that's about. It's like Godly repentance is it. If your computer, we talked about this a minute ago, if your computer is, is causing you to sin, go home, take it out, rip it out of the wall, take it in your garage and smash it. And you go, Rich, I can't do it. Well, then you don't want to repent. God loves it. God loves a man that will repent. He loved Jacob. Jacob was a liar. Uh, he loved David. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Why did he love them, guys? It's because they knew how to repent. They changed their life. They purposely made a decision to never go back there again. The TV's costing you sin, those three channels that you got, man. And never, you know how to get to those channels. Hey, on the way home, you call that cable company. You godly repent. You change your lifestyle. You change. That's what godly repentance is. And God loves it. 
He loves it. It's things that are practical like that. If that lady at your office is causing you to sin, go to get a cup of coffee a different way. Knock it off. Repent, turn, change. Don't ever go back there and start praying, God, take that passion, that desire away from me. Or or you'll live a life like Esau and you'll sin You'll confess you'll have a little regret and sorrow. Then you'll sin and you'll keep circling Mount Sinai and you'll never get to the promised land. Repentance. Can I tell you about my best day? And I'm going to sit down. I'm sorry. I, uh, my best day. My best day in Green Bay um, there was a difference maker in my life. I saw James here tonight, and, and Gary and Billy knows me real well. But I was lost um, all through college. And uh, I was in my fourth year at Green Bay. And uh, I thought if I could be the starting middle linebacker, if I could be the MVP or man of the year or any of that stuff, I thought I, could, I would be fulfilled. Married my college sweetheart, Sherry. We've been married 36 years. We were good people. We did good things. I was raised in a church. I, my dad was a deacon. My mom sang in the choir. I cut the grass. I mean, I, I know all about church. I, I know all about it. I, I didn't do drugs. I, wasn't a, I, didn't, I was an adulterer. I wasn't a bad guy. But I was lost. Okay? I believed in Jesus. And so... Uh, I was searching and, and uh, big time. And John Anderson, All-American from Michigan, Andy was my roommate for seven years at Green Bay. And Andy uh, would always invite me to chapel service. And, and, and real quick, when I was searching, he, he, and don't ever give up on a brother either, okay? Never give up on a brother. If you've invited him for 10 years, you invite him the next time. Never give up on a brother. And so Andy invited me to, ch- we were playing the New York Jets in New York and uh, I don't remember a thing, this guy. He was a Hall of Fame baseball player for the New York Yankees. I don't remember his name. And isn't that terrible? And uh, I just remember what he said, and he changed my life forever. He said that one day I envisioned um, the day of judgment. And he said, uh, I envisioned myself stepping through a turnstile. And he said, and Almighty God is on the, the throne. And he said, Jesus is seated to my right, and Satan is seated to my left. And he goes, and there's a long line behind me. And he goes, when it's my turn, unlike anybody else's turn, a semi-truck. And I'm thinking, baseball player. A semi-truck backs up, and, and Satan stands up, and he slings the doors open. I'm thinking, where's this guy going? And... and he said, Satan stands up and he starts, and, he, and it's computer printout paper. The truck is packed full. You remember what that, it was all connected back in the day. And it was the smallest print that you could possibly, and he said, Satan is standing there reading in front of God and Jesus. And he said, and I realize he's reading every single sin that I've ever committed. He goes, he said, I'm talking about the filthiest, filthiest, nastiest, grossest sins of the, the mind, the hands, the mouth, the eyes. He goes, and Satan is loving it. He's got my attention. And he goes on and on and on. He said it's vile. He goes, the shame that he had standing there in front of God and Jesus. And they were listening to this. He had been told that that they knew all, but he said, I just couldn't imagine. And finally, God, God's wrath, his anger, he stopped Satan. He looked right at him and he said, what about it? And he said, before I could speak, he said, Jesus stood up and he put his hand to the Father and he put his hand on him with tears coming down his face and he said, Father, it's okay, he's with me. And I remember being in that New York lobby hotel room, about 20 of us, on a Saturday night before a Sunday game, thinking Jesus Christ would never stand up for me. I was a fake, I was a liar. I was playing the role And I was struggling. And I'm telling you guys, I was one of those guys that uh, I couldn't wait to get out of there. This isn't a, like, I gave my life to the Lord right then. No, it wasn't like that, man. I couldn't breathe. I wanted to get out of there. I was ticked. And for three weeks, the hounds of heaven, thank you, Lord. He loved me enough to stay on me. 
and my life was miserable, miserable. I could care less about football, which was my God. Until one day of all places in an empty Green Bay locker room, God's irony. I got on my knees in a metal chair and I asked, I begged Jesus to come into my life. And only, only a loving and almighty God could change a filthy, pathetic loser like myself. And he transformed me and he changed me. Maybe you, you know him tonight. I hope and pray you do. I really do. Maybe all these years you, you said, well, I, I believe in Christ. Esau believed in him. My hope and prayer has been preparing for tonight is that you would come to a place of true godly repentance in your heart so that you could give Almighty God your best so that you wouldn't be wasted, you wouldn't be a disappointment, that you'll be that man for your family, for your grandkids, for your neighbor. You'll be that person. Some of you guys are going to get up from here in a minute and you're going to leave and, and you'll never remember. You know, you're just going to live and die. That's what's going to happen. You're just going to live and die an ex, uh, ex, in, uh, not a significant life. You're going to have zero impact. And it's your choice. And I'm begging you not to. I'm begging you to take and go all the way. Worship Jehovah God. Stop wavering. Thank you, Rich. I know for some of you that were here last time, if I say I'll be brief, you will laugh. But but I've been, you know, this is this is Man Church two. This isn't Man Church one, and 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 they all serve a purpose, and we're just following God's lead, and and praying who will be next. We've already secured Steve Farrar for the next one, and uh, and he'll he'll come in and and he'll be part of refining those of you that continue to be obedient. And come, this is not an event, as Brent said perfectly. This is about the men of this church being refined and becoming who God says we should be, but only he can make us. And, and, and Rich covered beautifully what it, it's a, what it looks like to be a man, but one thing that he kept talking about there at the end was repentance. And, it, and it's a pretty significant word when when you know he talked about the different moments in the bible i'm thinking about luke 13 you know you got all these religious people that are talking saying hey look at these galileans and you know they what they did and involving Pilate and mixing their blood with sacrifice and we had this tower fall on these people they must have been real evil these 18 that were killed by this tower that fell and jesus said oh let me stop you whoa whoa if you don't repent you'll perish repent or perish just like them the only you're no different in, than them if you don't repent we're all equal at the foot of the cross and 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 then you think about you think about the uh the fisherman peter all through this walk with jesus he can't get it right and but but, but he thinks he's going to get it right you know and you, I, I love the moment we think about it as, as the man and, and and the thing that god will do whatever he thinks he needs to do for us to repent he loves us enough to do whatever it will take to get us to the point of repentance. I, th I think about that and deal with that all the time, that, that moment when, when they're walking along and Jesus just gives the, to Peter, hey, Satan's asking my father to sift you. I'm praying for you. See, I would have wanted to hear, hey, my father is getting petitioned by Satan to sift you and I'm going to stop it. You know what Jesus said? Hope you come through. We're going to find out who you are. So he never really gets it right until what? And we've talked about this. Let's be real careful about this, guys. To Pentecost. Why? He received the Holy Spirit. We, we have to be extremely careful. And I wanted to stop and stop tonight. Stop comparing 
ourselves, because I'm just as guilty, to these men before Pentecost. Stop it. You know why? That's not where we are. You want a standard? Compare yourself to them after Pentecost. Well, they're different people then. They go from hiding and, and trying not to be recognized by a little girl at the campfire to getting beaten, and, 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 and the religious leaders said, look, their back's still bleeding, stinging. Just shut up about Jesus. We won't bother you. And they said they considered it an honor. They've been beaten for Jesus, and they couldn't wait to get out and talk about it and start talking about him again. See, that, that's much different than the way they acted before Pentecost. And we are not allowed to compare ourselves before Pentecost because we're on the other side of the, of the resurrection. We, we have access to the risen Christ. We have access to the Holy Spirit, His presence with us always. What do you say? It's good that I go because the Comforter is coming. You have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be with you everywhere now. And you have the power of the Holy Spirit. Anybody who has repented and has given their life to Jesus Christ and submitted his authority now has in their spirit the Holy Spirit. So if you don't look like the guys on the other side of the resurrection, it could be you just don't have it. See, see the most profound question, I, I, when we had Robert Smith speak, Danny, I read, I'm reading the book now, Doctrine That Dances. And so I'm reading his book, this incredible preacher, and he was talking about one of the guys that, that, that he respected, and I can't think of his name, but he, he also was a teacher, and he was asked, what's the most profound question that you ask all of these people that desire to be preachers and pastors? What's the most profound question? And he said, well, that's it. he didn't even check up. Easy. Have you been transformed by the risen Christ? That's the most profound question he says I've ever asked. The most important answer that we must find. Have you been transformed by the power of the risen Christ? Woo. So one thing that we have to do to get to that place and I'm going to drive this home, and then we're going to get to our time of response. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Jesus addressing the churches. And he gets to the church at Laodicea. Now, before you check out on me, I may, I may talk about a part of this that either you have never thought about or that you haven't heard in a while. Because, you know, we've heard many incredible messages from our own pastor about the church of Laodicea. And I know it's always a good example, especially if you're at a big church that has a lot of money. So, so I know you're saying, oh, I know where this is headed. But I'm, go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land on something that I had missed in this. You may not have, but I had missed in this. So he's addressing the church at Laodicea, which we all know was a very wealthy church, right? We've all been taught that. If not, know that if you've never been taught that. And, and we know that a lot of people use this message as, as an evangelical message. There's nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely there. But if we want to talk about really what Jesus is, is saying, he's saying to this church, look, look what he says in, in 15. I know your works. What, what, did, what did Rich say about the way we live may not be, it doesn't earn us salvation, but we talked about it even in the first man church, but it's the result of salvation, right? If you love me, obey my commands. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. And we talked about that last time. So he says, I know your works, and they are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, Rich beautifully talked about this, this, this trying to do both things, you know, be, be the world and, and, and be with Jesus and, you know, either worship Baal or, or, or worship Jehovah. Make a decision. And a lot of times the, people talk about this, and I, don't, and, and I used to do this, that Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. That's incorrect. That, Jesus would never, ever, ever wish or prefer that we be against him. Now, we either are for him or against him, but he would not prefer that. What you've got to know about the church at Laodicea is they were, their location was the reason why they were so wealthy. Now, in those days, water is huge, huge. If you got water, you got it going on. If you don't, you got problems. 
Now, a lot of people could find water to drink, but you know what was very rare? To have hot springs, and you actually had hot water. Laodicea had both. They had hot water, and they had cold water. So they had cold water for life. They had hot water for cleaning, for health. They, I mean, they, they had the best of both worlds. So what Jesus is saying in this passage, because don't, don't miss it, look at, look, and I got the English standard, not as beautiful, but it's, it's just a, here's, here's the Greek, here's the English, or the Hebrew, and the, wherever you are in the Bible. He says, your works are neither cold nor hot. So it means you're not either one. Meaning what? Cold is useful, hot's useful. See, I, I miss that. When I was a kid, I, I, I didn't see the message that way. I thought Jesus was saying, I wish you'd be for me or against me. Jesus would never wish I'd be against him. Never. I mean, he's pleading and wanting all of us to come to repentance. What he's saying is, hey, Laodicea, you're not useful. If you were some cold water, I could use that. If you were hot water, we can use that. But this lukewarm doesn't do anything. It has no purpose. I, I, I know your works, and they're not cold and they're not hot. You're useless. And he goes on to what, what we've been talking about. Look what he says next. And he says, you know, I'll spit you out of my mouth. We know that. Look at this, 17. For you say about themselves, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He's giving the step to true repentance because we're about to get see the word repent again. You know what he says? You know what Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea? You know what he's saying to Rick Burgess? Stop being delusional about who you really are. You, you, you think you're all right. You ever met that guy? I'm good. How you been doing? I'm good. I actually had a guy tell me one time, we were at a table, man, and we were lamenting about the things we had done wrong that we had been forgiven for. And a lot of people, a lot of rich talked about it. a lot of people believed in Jesus. They were cultural Christians. They had to come to the conclusion of the problems in, in the way they were living, that they weren't stumbling. They had lifestyles of sin. They went back and submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ and radically changed. And we're talking about our testimonies. And I notice he ain't got anything to say. And we get around to him. We said, brother, share it with us. Uh, I went down front when I was 12 years old. I've been good ever since. Wow. Wow. Let's mark him off the list of lunch uh, uh, people. I mean, so, and I thought to myself, that's delusional. So you've done everything right since you were 12 years old? I mean, you, I'm, not, I'm not saying doubt of salvation, but I mean, you never had a struggle? You never, I mean, so, so what Jesus says, you sit there and think you're rich. You think you need nothing. He goes, when I look at you, back to the first one, he just said, I know your works. I know who you are. I see your life. You're delusional about who you really are. So if you really ever want to repent, the first thing you got to start being is stop being delusional about who you really are. He says, here's how I see you, pitiful, naked, and poor, wretched. That's how it looks to me because I'm holy. And you think you don't need me. You think you got it. So, so the thing we got to think about is, number one, let's be useful. Do we look at our life and say we're, we're hot water or we're cold water? I mean, we can use either one of those. Or we lukewarm water. And when somebody says, tell me what you've done in response to the grace that's been shown you through Jesus Christ when he went to the cross for you. What have you done in response for that? He looks at your response. The great analogy that Rich used about Sammy and his son Jake. Hey, my son went to the cross for you, lowered himself, the king of kings, to be wretched, pitiful, and, 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 to, and to suffer, just lowered himself and went to the cross for you. What has your response been to that? Nothing you can earn, but should some, be some sort of response, a thank you. Are you hot water in this church? Are, are, are you cold water? I mean, can, can Danny say, I'll tell you one thing, that man church, Butch, anything we need, we can depend on them. They're in. Or will it continue to be the same 20% of, of the men in this church that do everything? The same ones. 80% of y'all just on a free ride. Really, this church should want for nothing. It's got all the money it needs. It's got plenty of men that if, they, if we would decide to be solid followers of Christ, say we won't be hot water or cold water, we want to be useful for the kingdom, this church should never. I mean, Danny and the staff should go to bed every night and sleep like babies because it's handled. 
I mean, we, we got everything we need. God has given, you know what the only bad thing about that is, though? We got no excuse. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we can never go, well, if you just give us a, I can't think of anything we needed. So how does it look? I mean, I mean, don't, don't you want to hear well done? I mean, don't you want that? Is that talking about goals? Is that a goal? Not to earn your salvation, but as the result of salvation. I, I can't imagine us really understanding salvation and having no response to it. And just kind of easing up. And you gotta quit being delusional, like you're talking about talking about cable. I I I do uh, commercials for a cable company. So they say you get everything you get everything we we got. I said, no, I'll pass. No, no. Don't want it. And the person thinks that I'm trying to protect everybody else. Oh, well, you know, we got those parent controls. I said, no, 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 no. I don't trust me. I don't want that garbage in my house. Oh, you don't want your kids to say, no, no, no. I know I'll watch it. So, so I, what I'll do is say, I just don't want it in my house. It's out. I protect, I'm, the, I'm the parent control for my children and what, what's on the TV and what's everything like that. So, But here's the problem. If I put it in there and say I just don't want them to watch it, then I'll watch it. And then what do you think they're going to do? Back to the example you gave. My oh, dad watches this garbage. Because I know me. I know me. See, I'm not delusional about who I am. I'm not delusional about my flesh. My flesh will do that thing. Well, I won't look at anything on TV unless it just shows up as I'm scanning. You ever done that? I have. That's delusional. We're delusional about who we are. And, and, and like he talked about, about, uh, about J- uh, McDonald's, stop, stop doing the card. You know why? You, Satan sits back. We all love football analogies. I do. I love them. He sits back, and it's almost like he goes, you know what? I can throw the ball deep anytime I want to. Sexual sin. Right, we got some brothers from the last man church. He said, I'm sitting down with guys, and you know what everybody's talking about? We're working out sexual sin. And he said, I've come to the conclusion, and he's right, if we can conquer that in our lives, you wouldn't believe how many men would be able to be productive for the kingdom and for their families. They, it's just got them bogged down. And you know what? Jesus is stronger than that. I mean, there's no sin that he can't overcome. You just got to repent and submit. So let's go into what he says. He says, stop being delusional about who you are. Here's 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Think about that. Hey, you're wanting, you, you got gold? You got piles of it, Laodicea? I'm not impressed. I'm telling you to come buy real gold from me that's been refined by fire. Now that is of some value. Boy, we don't want to go down that road, do we? We don't want to go down that road, do we? I don't know that I want to be refined by fire. I understand that. I don't either. See, that's the thing when people talk about what, what and I, it's not the only st- hard thing our family's ever been through, but it's the most easy one for him to wrap around. You think I wanted to bear a son? Hey, man, that's great. I've said this before. Jesus it loved me so much that he didn't put me in the position of coming to me and say, let me tell you what I want to do, but i got to make sure you're in. I'm going to kill, allow Satan to kill one of your kids. Just like with Job. You know, we forget that sometimes, don't we? I had somebody, you know, with Sherry's book out now, you know, I knew the theology garbage would start. I can't believe you'd say that, that it was Satan that killed your son. I said, that's right. I said, just like Satan killed Job's son, but who let Satan kill Job's son and his children? Ten of them. But was a, with a storm, by the way. Who let him do that? Why? So that Job be refined by fire. And so Job would say at the end of all, they say, you know, before I'd heard of you, but now I see you. You're right. I do know you better now. I'm stronger. Let me tell you the beautiful thing about we got to come off this temporal garbage. Have you ever noticed that Job was given double of everything that he lost except his children? You know, I don't remember the exact numbers, Danny, but, you know, if you say he had 100 uh, cattle, he got 200. But it said that Job got 10 children. Why didn't he get 20? Because he still got the original 10. He did get 20. Those, those children were as live, uh, I mean, the day that Job walked into heaven as they ever were. They were separated from their father, but they weren't gone. My son is as alive today as he's ever been. And as my wife beautifully said, she said, you know, I don't always like his tactics, but I cannot argue with his results. I don't like it. But you know what? 
And, and Danny said this to us, and, and, it was, and, and he was so Holy Spirit inspired when he said it, because I've seen it for the last eight years. You were incredibly sensitive to the Spirit because you said it right. There are people and things that are going to happen through this that weren't going to happen any other way. And I've seen that to be true. You know what? So if, if that's it, then fine, because this isn't it. This isn't heaven. If, if that refines us, hey, you, I think we're better for the kingdom after this than we were before. We are. So he said, if you think you're rich, let me show you how to be rich. And you have some gold, but have gold that's been refined by fire. Now, now that's of us some value. Be ready so you can get out there. You think I care if somebody wants to kill me? You think I care what's going to happen to me if I make a stand for Christ? I couldn't care less. Like Paul, uh, Paul said, look, I got to the point where it was to live as Christ, to die as gain. I got a brother here at the church that I just went through a, a situation, and he came to me, and he, and he taught. He even taught in Sunday school the other day, and he was 100% right. He said, you know, to die is the easy part. To live as Christ is what's hard. Living is what's hard. Ain't nothing hard about dying if you know Jesus. Living is what's hard. You know, I don't even tell people this, hey, man, you better do this. Because you might die. You know what I say? You better do this because you might live. That's what's hard. So, so God is saying, look, if you really want to figure this out, then look what he goes on to say. He goes on to say, look, he said, I'll give you white garments so that you may, be clo- may close yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you might see. Look at 19, guys. To whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous in what? Say it. To whom I love, I reprove and discipline. What does zealous mean? Aggressively, enthusiastically. Repent. And you know what he says? I'll do what I have to do to get you to repent. Because until you repent, you're going to die and go to hell. So I'll do whatever I have to do to get you to repent. Because I love you enough, I'll discipline you. How many of you have ever had to do any kind of coaching or anything like that? Any kind of coaching? Do you ever notice that some of the most spoiled, rotten, bratty kids, they almost start grinning when somebody finally disciplines them, somebody finally gets on them and demands something from them? They crave it. They crave it. You know what they see from, from parents who never discipline them? That their parents are so lazy and their parents are so regretted ever having them, they just wish they'd get out of the way. Because I got news for you. Do you agree? Parenting's hard if you do it right. You got to make hard decisions. And I've got dads that have done some things that they knew was best for their children that could only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you in this room that have told me stories where when your kids were wayward, you had to turn them over to their sin. Hey, hey, Dad, I, 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 I've, I've, I've done all this stuff again. And that first day you say, I'm not coming to get you. I'll let you waller in that so maybe you'll wake up like the prodigal son. I'll let you get in the pig dung. But the beautiful thing about the prodigal son, though, when you do go through some discipline and we do allow ourselves to be disciplined or we discipline our children, my favorite part of the prodigal son, I mean, there's the obvious stuff, but my favorite line in the prodigal son is when he sees that kid who's been laying in pig dung. Uh, remember, he even looks around and says, where's all those friends I thought I had? They left you. Once the party was over and you ran out of money, they're gone. And he finally goes back home to his daddy, and this is my favorite line, and it may be you tonight. While he was still a long way away his daddy started running to it that's what happened to me y'all heard my testimony in the man church one all I did was submit I submitted myself I believed in Jesus but I finally submitted to his lordship and I was a long way away but he came running to me and radically changed my life and prepared me for the things that would be ahead and eventually began to give me gold refined by fire. And instead of running from it, I embraced it. 
I mean, you think about Stephen when he's getting stoned, that beautiful moment. Stephen says, don't hold this against him. What? This is on the other side of the resurrection, y'all. This is Holy Spirit stuff. And it said that he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Not sitting, standing. And he said, receive my spirit. The stoning, by the way, didn't stop. You know what he was getting? Well done. Hey, there's a guy standing over holding everybody's coats so they can throw better. You're not going to believe what I'm going to do through him. He's never going to forget when he saw this and what you said. But right now you come on home. He's got the tougher job because he's still going to be living. His, his refinement is still ahead. Yours is over. Don't you, don't, don't you want to stand for something? Don't, don't you want to make a difference for the kingdom? Not to earn your salvation, but as a thank you for it. And listen to this. For the men of this church, this is my challenge to you as we close and get ready for your response. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. 21, to the one who conquers, don't miss that. I will grant him to sit with me at my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. I love when Jesus says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is this a salvation message? Sure it is. Jesus knocking at your heart. It's beautiful. But you know what else he's saying? Are you willing to get up and be the man that goes to the door of our church and says, Jesus, come on back in here with us? Our, our rebellion, I don't know what the rest of these men are going to do, but mine's over. I want to be part of your church and the church you've placed me in. Just like me, I was in rebellion. I'm going off doing men's ministries all over the place, and Jesus said, you got nothing for Shades Mountain? You're not even involved with your own men? You're not doing anything for your own church? Hey, I love what you're doing out here. That's great, but are they just get ignored? Why don't you do anything in your own body? And so this vision was born. And if you don't think God was in it, I walked up to Mark Garnett and Jordan Hanson and said, who's doing men's ministry now? And Mark said, well, God didn't wait long. He just walked in the restaurant. Brent comes over to me. I said, I'm looking for you. He said, I'm looking for you. I said, God told me I'm supposed to be part of the men's ministry at Shades Mountain. He said, God told me you're supposed to be part of the men's ministry at Shades Mountain. And I said, well, I guess we got something to do. And look, it's, it's in its infancy. I don't know how this is going to go. Some of y'all going to fade away. Some people didn't even make it from Man Church 1 to 2. That's all right. I hope hopefully some of them that, that will come back might have got your feelings hurt, whatever. But what I'm talking about is as we go through, and if we're committed to this and, he, and we honor him, he's going to honor this. And a remnant, I don't know if I told you all this last time, God woke me up in the middle of the night before we had the first man church. I ran up to Brent and I said, look, I don't know what kind of numbers this means because God, God's ways are not my ways. He woke me up in the middle of the night, and I don't do this. Look, I'm as Southern Baptist as anybody, so we don't go around having an experience every time we turn around. He woke me up in the middle of the night. I got up. I was wide awake. He said, I'm going to call a remnant. I said, what? I was like, what is, did I hear a remnant? You know, I'm but nudging Sherry. Did you hear the word remnant? She's like, what are you doing? And I said, uh, he said, I'm going to call a remnant. And you know what? Get out of your bed and get on your face. I got out of the bed and got on my face before the Lord. So I don't know who's going to be part of the remnant, but there's going to be a remnant come out of this, as there always is. And that's all we need. See, God's will is not something you have to do. It's something you get to do. Some of y'all will choose not to be part of it. That's your loss. But for those of you right now that are saying, you know what, I'm not going to be delusional about where I am. I will open the door and say, Christ, come back in here and be with us. I'll lead in this church. I'll lead my family. I will be the leader that says, I'm going to the door, and I'm going to tell Jesus I want him back in here with us. I want to be a person who is moving the gospel forward, not a person who keeps having to take and take and take and take and take. 
do something. Be hot water or cold water. But in order for that to take place, for some of us in this room right now, you got to repent. And it's got to be sincere. You're never going to do what 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14 says. You're not going to do what the, the challenge to the church at Laodicea until you first repent. And some of you got some problems. You've already repented, but you got some problems you got to deal with tonight. That's why we're here. We're about to get in here and talk it out as men. The most beautiful part of these services is when the, some of your fellow men of this church are going to stand across here in the front, and some of you are going to be bold enough to come forward and say, hey, man, can you pray with me about this? Some of you need to give your life to Jesus. You realize that's really never taken place. That'd be great. We got men that'll stand down here, and we're ready to receive you, and, and we're ready to talk about that. That's what this is all about. You don't have to do this alone. Men always try to do it alone. I have found that I don't do that very well. I have found that I thrive when I reach out to brothers and say, let's do this together. Okay? Every single one of us had to be redeemed by Jesus. At the foot of the cross, we're all equal. Why don't you come and receive him? Why don't you turn that 180 and repent of sin? Whatever it is. And you move to Jesus and say, I want to be transformed by the living Christ. And that I want to go to work and do what you've told me to do. And I want to have that shield that is you to protect me from the adversary, my wife, my children, that I currently have or that I'm going to have. Right? Let's make that decision now. Let's all stand to our feet.